friends. I am very happy to be back in Southern California and so happy to meet all of you again. What I've come to share with you is my experience with a perfect living master, the great master Azur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh Ji. He altered my life totally, altered the lives of thousands of others, many of whom I have seen experiencing that great alteration in life. It was not a very big alteration. It looked like a difficult one. The alteration in life was, instead of looking at reality outside of ourselves, we look at the reality inside of ourselves. That what is outside is merely a reflection of what is inside. That one great shift of perception, that what we are looking at outside is not real, but a holographic picture of something being generated from inside makes an entire change in our attitude to life. Today, the life outside of ourselves appears to be the only reality. We have no access to any other reality. We can move from one reality to another, but when we move to another reality, we lose contact with the one which we first thought was real. A good example, which we all have, is the example of going to sleep at night and having a dream. When we are in the dream state, that is our reality. We do not know where we are sleeping. We do not know what is happening to our physical body. We take another body, the dream body, to be our own self. The most surprising thing is that it is not only another body we are taken, but the self in that body is the same self that went to sleep. The self did not change. The self remained the same no matter whether we are in a dream body or in this body or any other body or no body at all. There was a Chinese philosopher, Fahin, and he had a dream. He dreamt that he was a butterfly. He was flying around in a garden full of beautiful flowers. Those flowers were so beautiful, so radiant, so full of color and light. He had never seen such flowers in this world. It occurred to him that this must be more a higher reality, more real than what he thought was physical reality. And yet he was just a butterfly flying around. When he woke up from the dream, he marveled, am I really Fahin, the philosopher, who had a dream that he was a butterfly, or am I really a butterfly? Now having a dream that I am Fahin, the philosopher, how do I determine this? He consulted with a few of his friends, other philosopher friends, other mystical friends, people who studied metaphysics, and he said, you know, I had a dream in which I was a butterfly. His friend said, that's a very stupid thought. You can't be a butterfly. A butterfly doesn't look like you. A butterfly has wings. You must have seen a butterfly. The only way to explain your dream is that in your dream, you were dreaming that you were seeing a butterfly going around. Fahin said, that was not my experience at all. My experience was, I was a butterfly. The I in my wakeful state now is the same eye that existed in the butterfly. I did not see my eyes in the butterfly like I can't see my eyes in my physical body. I can see things around it. I can see things in front of it. I saw the same things as the butterfly. The fact that the self, the I, did not change in spite of the fact that he appeared to be a butterfly and he continued to believe he was a butterfly, not that he saw a butterfly, shows that these experiences, which create a sense of reality for us, they are all being experienced by oneself. The self does not change, never changes, will never change, has never changed. The self continues to be the same, no matter what the experience around it, no matter what the form around the self is. The self can take any form, and it can even be formless, and the self will still be there. The experience of the self is the only experience that exists for us. Nobody can come and tell me, I had an experience that I was the self here and I was experiencing somewhere else. The experience occurs only to the self. Therefore, if we have to define reality differently, not what looks real because we can check it out with our perceptions, 
not because I can touch these things, therefore they are real, because I can see these things, therefore they are real. To cross check with the same perceptions that I'm using for experiencing this world is a very faulty way of checking out. I could do the same thing in a dream. In a dream, I could touch everything and say it's real. And I wake up and find it was a dream. The means of checking out reality were based on the same perceptions, which I was taking as real anyway. Therefore, to check reality by referring to your own perceptions is no way of checking up. It will always be real. Whatever you create outside of yourself will always be real. But the one thing that does not change, no matter how many times you change your form, no matter how many times you cease to exist in any form, is the self. The self never changes. So if you want to define reality as that which does not change, then there's only one thing real, the self. Now, where is the self? People ask me this question. Here are so many of us sitting here. There are so many selves here. How can there be so many selves? Well, when we go to sleep, supposing in a dream, we see 20 people in a dream. Are those 20 people dreaming or one is dreaming? We don't know. If we ask those 20 people in our dream, uh, are we dreaming? It looks like we are dreaming. Some mystics are telling us in the dream that we are dreaming. This is a dream state. It's not real. That is coming out from our consciousness. And we ask all of them, they say, well, then which one is dreaming? We are all seem to be dreaming. And then you wake up and find there was only one dreamer. Never was more than one. How about those 20 people that you saw? They were created from inside you. But were they real or unreal? It is another big question. If you see 100 people in a dream, are they all real for the dream or not? For the dream, yes, they were all real. But you may wake up and find 20 of them were your friends in wakeful state. The 80 somehow came up only in the dream. Then you can say even in the dream there was a distinction between 20 and 80. Those 80 were made up only for the dream and 20 had an existence even beyond the dream. Because when you wake up, those 20 were still there. Supposing you get enlightened to a higher level of consciousness and you wake up again and find out that the wakeful state itself was a dream. And you, the dream, you see so many people. When you wake up, you find there are people there, but they're much fewer in number. The rest were made up for the wakeful state. And the real people are just fewer who are still there. Supposing you wake up again to a still higher level of consciousness and find out the 20 people who were real, only five are now real. The rest were made up for that state. Supposing you wake up finally to the ultimate dreamer and you find out only one was real. There was only one dreamer. All the others were created as the process of creating the many from the one. The one through a dream process, one through the operation of consciousness can create the many. And if you do it in levels, you can create a vast multitude of universes. You can create exactly what we are experiencing around us just through the process of successive dreaming. This is exactly the nature of creation as described by those who have been able to withdraw their attention from the outside to the inside to reverse this flow of attention inwards from where the experience is origin originating. And it can be done successively, one after the other. So ultimately you arise and find there's only one. When we in religion and spiritual belief systems believe there is only one, have we experienced it? We continuously experience the many. We interact with the many. We have problems with the many. We have happiness with the many. If we go by the definition of one and many that exists in the physical world, the one would be a terrible place to be in. We'd be so lonely there. So the, who's going to try a spiritual path where you ultimately find out you're only one? If we do apply this criterion that at the end we only find there's only one, it was one dreamer who successively created the entire experiences of different levels of consciousness, and we find that out, we'll feel very lonely. Well, wouldn't that be a good justification for creating the many? Some people ask, why did we create so many? If we were very happy living in our ultimate 
sublime permanent state, immortal state, why did we need to have this creation with so many? Well, that could be one justification. But that's not the truth. The truth is loneliness stops where the mind stops. These experiences to which we relate, whether it's loneliness or it's company or it's sadness or it's happiness or it's good deeds or bad deeds, all these pairs of opposites that we have created for our experience, they are all created by our mind. The mind is the useful, very wonderful equipment attached to our consciousness, attached to the self, which can create these wonderful experiences. First of all, the best experience the mind creates is time and space, in which to put all other experiences in. Is it possible for any one of us to imagine that if all time and all space were pulled out of our experience, what would it be like? It's impossible. It's impossible because we are unable to experience anything at this time except through the filter of the mind. And the mind will prevent any experience which is not placed in time and space. Therefore, we are shut out from a true experience of the self. We cannot experience the self. We cannot know what that self, single self is, which alone is real, so long as we are experiencing anything from the mind. And yet, the mind will come in the way of every experience we have. That's why it's so important to understand how the projection of the self takes place. And when it is above the mind, there is no such thing as many and one, no such thing as loneliness and non-loneliness. There is no pairs of opposites at all. Therefore, that experience cannot be related in any language that we know, cannot be related in any any spectacular way that we can make out. No visualization is possible. There is no amount of thinking that you can create that feeling who you are if you are beyond the mind. And yet, there is a way by which you can experience it. You can experience it and be absolutely dumb, not being able to tell what you experienced. How do you experience something that is beyond the mind? This method is very simple and yet difficult. It's simple but difficult. Why is it simple? Because Bulle Shah, one of the old mystics, made it look very simple. He said, Rabda ki pana, etho putna, ethe lana. He said, not difficult to find God. Just pull your attention from here and put it there. He made it look so simple. But that's the truth. How do we experience this universe? We experience it only through our attention. Wherever we place our attention becomes our experience. If you withdraw attention, you don't have an experience, which means it's not the whole of consciousness that is operating to give us an experience. It's only one part, the front part of it called attention. Consciousness is an ability to be aware of anything. It's a potential. It's a potential to create any experience without limitation. That's consciousness. Consciousness gets restricted when we bring it to awareness. Awareness is that of which we are aware now, including memories. If we can remember something, we are aware of it. But beyond memory and beyond what we can see around us through perception, we have no awareness. Awareness is a very restricted part of, of consciousness. But then when you come to awareness, we are aware of the whole world here with our thoughts, with our memories, and with what we can perceive through the senses. And yet, only that part becomes effective awareness for us where we put our attention. If we don't put attention on something, it's just hidden somewhere else. We may call it subconscious, unconscious, some other area of which we're not aware at this moment. So the restrictive nature of consciousness and awareness becomes more restricted when it comes to attention. And yet, attention is the greatest gift given to us to find out who the self is. There is no greater gift, there is no greater tool we have to discover the unchanging, un, unalloyed, real, permanent self than the use of attention. If we can place our attention outside of our body and experience a physical world, how about placing our same attention inside ourselves and experiencing where this experience is being projected from? Why can't we withdraw our attention the same way like we focus our attention. There are just two types of 
experiences of attention. One is focusing your attention on something and that becomes an experience for us. The other is to withdraw your attention from there. Throughout our life, we have practiced nothing but focusing our attention. Nobody taught us how to withdraw attention. We were always told how to attend to our books, how to attend to people, how to attend to things, how to attend to our food, how to attend to our life outside. Therefore, we became great experts in focusing attention outside of ourselves. We never got a chance to practice the opposite of it, the withdrawal of attention to that point from where the attention was flowing out in the first place. When we focus attention on something, where is it coming from? Let's look at a simple example. You're reading a book and you're focusing your attention to the eyes because you're reading, you're using the visual equipment you have in this perception of vision and sight and you look at the book and put your attention, where are you reading it? The eyes are conveying it somewhere into the head. Head say there's you be conveying it to some place in the optic area and the optic nerve carries it there. There are signals, they're going on and you say we are reading. It's a well-established way that the reading of a book through attention is only pulling you back to that point for where it's originating. And then since it's focused outside, you can read a book. Of course, if you were unconscious, supposing you're hit on the head, you become unconscious. Your optic nerve is all right. Your eyes are open. Your book is in front of you. You can't read. Ultimate signal that makes you read a book is the focusing of attention from consciousness to the optic area in the brain right outside to the book. And that area which creates consciousness, nobody knows. We had a, we had a VIP in India who got knocked down in, an, in a car accident and was in a coma for several days. In fact, he was in a coma for several months. He was an important person from outside. So we tried to get the best surgeons from around the world. We got brain surgeons who had opened up the heads more than a thousand times. And when they were trying to examine this patient and tell us what happened and how a person is in continuous coma, a political chief who was examining that case along with the doctor said, doctor, can you tell me what makes a person conscious? And that great doctor who had done a thousand brain surgeries answered, sir, this is a question we have not been able to answer for thousands of years. We don't know where consciousness comes from. All we know is that there are some areas in the brain pretty close to the center, pretty close to the pituitary body that's hanging inside, pretty close to the pineal gland, somewhere there. If we knock that off, a person becomes unconscious. We know there's something in the center of the head that can be knocked off and consciousness as we know, the ability to be alive and the ability to receive perceptions, gets knocked out. At least some information that man gave. The information was that ultimately all experiences being generated for us outside, and being picked up by attention, by focusing attention on those experiences, are being recalled and actually experienced somewhere in the center of the head. Let's work on this much knowledge. Let's say, okay, there is something in this physical head. There's something in the center of the head. It's not very difficult to know where that particular gland is, where the pineal gland is, or where the pituitary body hangs. We do not need to know that. We, know, we need to know a little approximate area. Why approximate? Because right now we are operating from there. Right now, as source of consciousness, as source of attention, we are there, right now. We don't have to go to a book to find out where we are. We are there. When we look at something with the two eyes, and the two eyes, they don't see. We try to use the eyes to see different images and they combine together to create depth and they create three-dimensional picture for us. But where do we see? Where do we see the combination that the two eyes are seeing? We don't see two. We see only one. Where do they combine? They don't combine outside. The rays of light reflected from things outside are picked up by the eyes, create inverted images on the retina. The retina is merely an extension of the optic nerve. The optic nerve carries signals to the head. But where do we see? Right now I'm asking question, where do we see things when we are looking through the eyes? Do we see right here at the front 
or do we see inside? If you just examine this simple example, you will find we always see things behind the eyes. We see things exactly from where attention is originating from the center of the head. Same is true of every perception, every sense perception. We are experiencing this world from the center of our head behind the eyes. And if we know this much, that the attention flows from the middle of our head, between the ears, behind the eyes, where these eyes combine together to become one image. If we can understand that just as a physiological fact, as a fact of observance of our own self, at least we can start from there and say, what would happen if we were to place our attention at that point? Instead of putting attention on things outside, what if we tried to practice putting our attention behind the eyes at that point from where attention is originating and going out? If you can do that, you are on the way to discovering the true self. Now that's simple enough. What, what's difficult about it? All we have to do is, like we put attention on something else, we put attention on a book to read, we put attention on the musical instrument to hear, we put attention on a person to talk to a person, if the same attention is being put there, where's the problem? Two problems. One, we are not used to it. We are used to focusing attention outside. We are not used to pulling it back. We are not used to pulling it back. We have so much problem, even after learning. Put the attention there, we close our eyes and make an image of ourselves and say, that's me sitting there in the center of the head and putting attention on that. That's not putting attention on yourself. You're making an image. Where are you actually? You are the one who is watching that little being you created in your head. You are at that point, not in where you're seeing the image. We are so used to putting attention on something outside of ourselves. We employ the same systems when we try to meditate and sit inside the head. We create an artificial self and look at it and say, there, I am sitting there. That's not yourself. That's an image you're creating. Like all images you're creating with your consciousness outside, you just created another image inside. That image which you see inside is never inside. I give a simple experience, simple experiment to people to try it out. You close your eyes and say, here I can see myself sitting behind the eyes. I'm bringing up this point specifically because a lot of people meditating for years, decades, have been caught up in this error, in this mistake in meditation. So I'm bringing it up in a more detailed way. Supposing you close your eyes and say, there is me sitting there and I'm at the right place, third eye center behind the eyes. You can check out if you're really there by simple use of your hands like this. Right now, you have a feeling where your eyes are. You are aware of it. When you're body conscious, when your physical body is your awareness, you know where your eyes are. You don't have to think about it. If you, you close your eyes and say, touch your eyes with your hand, immediately your hand will go there. You know where it is. Now when you make close your eyes, you can always touch your closed eyes. Now close your eyes and make the little image of yourself inside and bring the hands and touch your eyes. You'll be shocked that you will cross your hands and the image will just be outside of it. Just by closing eyes, you don't go inside the head. You're still looking outside. And the fact that you're making an image, all images are created outside. Because you're trying to create images with this visual equipment. You're trying to see things with these eyes. The eyes being shut does not mean you have moved away to any other kind of vision. The vision required to be where you are inside does not consist of this physical vision at all. It does have another vision, which we poo-poo and we ridicule it. The vision of imagination. We call it too imaginary. And we don't take care of our imaginary vision. Supposing we want to visualize that we are sitting on top of this building. And we visualize there we are sitting. Easy enough. We never use these eyes. We did not want to create anything outside. We are using imagination to say we are sitting on top of this building. We are imagining we are sitting in New York. We can do it right now. It's a great powerful tool. Imagination is a powerful tool that opens up our ability to use a set of perceptions that is not physical. We sometimes think these astral perceptions must be something very rare. 
would it surprise you if you said that the astral perceptions are no different than imaginary perceptions? That the perceptions of imagination solidify and become more real than physical perception when you withdraw your attention from the physical and put it on the astral. So therefore, it's a very great benefit to us to know this, that we can use our imagination to place ourselves, the one that is looking at everything, the one that's looking at the back of the eyes, the one that can feel their ears around us, the one that can feel there's a head above me. That's yourself, not what we make as a picture in front of us. If you can practice the simple thing, and the difficulty is because we are not practicing it. That's one difficulty of a simple thing. The second difficulty is that we are using the mind for all these functions, including imagination. And the mind has been given an entity by us. We have made it into a separate entity. We have made it into a separate being. We have identified our own life form, our own soul, and identified with the mind and think the mind has the soul and not we. We have identified with the mind to that extent that when we think, we say, I am thinking where the truth is, the mind is thinking for us. That we are not the mind. We totally forgotten that. That's another very big handicap in discovering who you are because then we are using the mind to focus there. The mind having been given all the power of our own consciousness starts to protect itself. In self-defense, it runs out to outside experiences as much as it can. People say if they lose their keys, they want to find them, try meditation. The mind will go out to find their keys. The mind will think of everything outside in meditation, even when it doesn't think like that otherwise. The mind is trying to protect itself. It's a survival. It's a game of survival for the mind to create. That's the second big difficulty. These two difficulties make it so difficult for us to do a simple thing of withdrawal of our attention behind the eyes. Of withdrawing our attention to the point from where attention is flowing outside. Otherwise, the method is very simple. What would actually happen if you are able to do that with practice, with time? It takes time and it takes practice. Supposing you practice on a regular basis and say every day I'm getting closer to closer and closer. I am able to concentrate more on some method which I'm using to stay in and not allow the mind to run out too much. Supposing you do that, you can withdraw your attention to yourself inside. The technique for training the mind to give up thinking of outside and to be trained to get inside are very simple. They have been used for centuries. First is repetition of words. Mind thinks in words. Mind thinks in words and in images and pictures and memories. Mind has no other way to keep us busy except it argues, continuously speaks inside us. Mind is a continuous speaker. I never met a person who says, I allowed my mind, sh now shut up. Mind never shut up. It never shuts up. Always speaks. And what do we do? We listen. We are constant listeners. And the mind is constant speaker, and the mind's speech is such as connects us with the experiences outside of this, of ourselves in this world. So we remain distracted all the time by the mind. If you make the mind speak words that the mind does not choose, if you make the mind speak, repeat those words the mind doesn't understand, and keep on repeating, at least we are blocking the mind for some time at least to think of outside things and distract us. The whole use of Simran, mantra, repetition is only this, to prevent the mind from thinking of other things, put new words into the mind, repeat them one after the other, and don't allow the mind to think of other things. It's one of the techniques, one of the very simple techniques that has been used for a long time with some amount of success. When we keep on repeating, the mind can flip over into imagining through pictures. We see friends sitting there, we see other people we love and we hate. Their pictures start coming in front. The mind can keep on repeating the word you give it. The mind can do Simran for long periods and you are still distracted by so many other things that are coming in front of you in the form of pictures. So there is a second method to keep the mind busy. That is a beloved 
who generates love in you, love and devotion in you, put the picture arbitrarily, imaginatively in front of you and hold that picture. If you can hold the picture, repeat the words, you are really blocking the mind from a lot. These two methods have worked. They are called Simran and Dhyan or repetition of words and contemplation of the face of a beloved. These have worked. A third method, which is even better than these two, is that if you can do some preliminary work, some little bit of work to hold steady for little time, not all the time, but for short periods of time behind the eyes in your head, then you can start hearing sounds inside. Sounds can be heard all the time. Even now you can hear some sounds inside and outside. The outside sounds are purely physical. And they rely upon the physical eardrum. They rely upon the physical system in the physical body. But the inner sounds do not rely upon that. The inner sounds can be very minor sounds resembling physical sounds. Like sound of a thunder, sound of bells, sound of little bells, sound of crickets, sound of a train coming into a railroad station, sound of a whistle. Those are kinds of sounds we can hear with very little effort. Well, at least they are there. But those sounds have one advantage. Those sounds do not come from outside and those sounds do not operate through the eardrum. So much so that even if you heard a loud sound there and drop a pin outside, you can hear both. Which means the function of the physical ears is quite different from the function of the internal listening apparatus we have, which of course is the function of the sense perceptions inside not taken through the physical body, but operating by themselves, which can hear that sound. When you hear those sounds, you are able to hold your attention on the sound. Third method. All three in combination can help us a lot. So the methods employed today in a physical world with all the distractions in the physical world are very effective. Only we need to practice them for some time. The greater our distractions, the greater our attachments and desires for the outside world, the longer it takes. The less we have these distractions, the easier it is to get, in, get back. But supposing you are able to achieve this, what would happen? What will be the, your experience if you are able to pull your attention behind the eyes and are able to stabilize yourself, feel you are inside the head of a human body? That you are not the human body, you are inside this human body in this place. What would happen? You would gradually not know where your hands are, where your feet are. You would wonder where they are. You might open your eyes to see if they are still there. Gradually, you will not know where your arms and your legs have gone. Gradually, you will not know where your torso has gone. Gradually, you will not know where your body has gone. You are still there. Very much alive. Very much aware of yourself and what's happening around you. Exactly like you are aware now. And yet, you are not aware of this body. This is not a new process. We all experience this process when we die. Sometimes death takes place very quickly. We have no time to see how we are dying. Sometimes we see terminally ill people dying slowly. When you see people dying slowly, if you go to hospital and see a person dying, they are talking to us, telling us we don't know where our hands and feet are. Can you move my leg there? The leg is already there. They're talking like that, they've become unconscious of their extremities. Then they become unconscious of their torso. Ultimately, when they die in the head, they, they're dead. The body is finished. There's no life in the body. So death takes place in the same order in which withdrawal of attention takes place through a meditational process. It is called dying while living, very appropriately. You're still alive. Nothing has happened to the body. Your vital forces are functioning. Everything is intact. And yet your experience is that which would happen if you were really dying. So this experience of dying while living, the ability to pull your attention to that extent that you become unaware of your physical body, that's a great experience. It's not an outer body experience. It's an experience of discovering your new self. An outer body experience still remains a connection with this physical body. People who have had out-of-body experiences, I've met many of them, they feel that they are being stretched out somewhere 
and they are still attached to this body through a silver cord or some kind of a connection. They are always worried that if they go too far, they might crack the silver cord and die. They are afraid of death. On the other hand, if you experience withdrawal of attention by focusing your attention behind the eyes in the center and being there to the extent that you do not know where your body is, is dying while living without any change to the body, without any fear of death of this body. In fact, I recall my dad, my father, who was initiate of great master before anybody else in the family. When he got initiated and he was so keen on it, he was teaching philosophy and he had questions on metaphysics, which his professors could not answer. And when he met the great master, great master gave him the answers to his metaphysical questions. His professors could not answer. It affected him so much. He was very keen to meditate and get results. When he meditated and the consciousness was pulled from the body, he felt he was going to die. He stopped meditation, got frightened and went back to great master. He said, what have you taught me? This kind of meditation leads to death. And great master said, do you know, people can die any moment. But do you know, as a matter of record, that nobody has ever died in meditation? How is that? There must be something that protects you even from physical death, if you are meditating. And there are no examples of that. Therefore, why are you afraid? You have to cross this stage. You have to cross this fright because you feel you are alone in this. But the moment you cross this state, in the case of initiation by a perfect living master, you are no longer alone after that, ever. Who do you expect to see when you pull the attention there? Will you be alone or there will be somebody else? He said, according to your teaching, you should be there. He said, certainly, if I am not there, I have, you have not been initiated. If I am there, you are never afraid. We travel together. This body does not die. This body maintains all its vital functions. The reason why we can feel we are withdrawing from the body is purely an act of withdrawal of attention. And that attention is not responsible for the vital functions of the body, which is autonomous. Therefore, when you withdraw attention, you are putting your attention on certain points in the body. These little points, the layers of points that exist inside, 18 points exist in our body, 18 special places which can be triggering different experiences. They are all built into this body to give us experiences beyond this body. Six of those centers which can trigger new experiences lie below the eyes. Twelve of these triggers lie behind and above the eyes. These six centers below the eyes, you can put your attention on any one of them and get a new experience. But they'll all be experiences of energy, energetic experiences. Not to higher awareness, but new forms of energy. But if you put your attention on the twelve centers above the eyes, you get new experiences in awareness. You can have your awareness answering questions about the whole of creation. You can find answers to your questions about where you originated from. You can answer questions about consciousness itself through those 12 centers in the body. And while you are in the body, you can do that. It's not that you are really have, going to die and get the experience. The experience has been built into this physical body and has been built perfectly in the physical body. In no other form of life has that system been built so perfectly as in the human body. Indeed, there is no other form of life in which you can achieve this while staying in that form and getting these experiences except the human body. You are very lucky to have a human body. Therefore, don't be frightened. Go ahead and see who you will meet there. Now, that, of course, brought to light that there is a certain phase in which we like to meditate while we are still holding on to this body. We don't want to die. And that fear of death which has been instilled into our minds because of preservation of a physical system of experience that we are having, which alone is real for us. That fear of death is preventing us from having real experiences. When we overcome that and discover, and the only way to discover it and to overcome it is do it gradually, step by step. People who rush, why want to have an accelerated experience? How can I speed it up? I tell them, don't. Because you are not used to it. You will be surprised how quickly you can get frightened by things. 
because they are new. For you, they are new. You haven't done it for a long time. We don't know how long. May not be this life, maybe several lifetimes. Maybe for eons of creation, maybe millions of years, you have shut off that experience. And therefore, it looks new. So therefore, how do we get over this fright? Slow and steady, one step at a time. Then you take one step, then you take next step. It makes it easy. That is why there is no rush. We don't know how long we have been waiting for this opportunity. We don't know how long we have been seekers inside ourselves, seeking the truth, seeking to escape from a system of experiences we are tired of. We don't know how long it has been. We are only looking at one life. Our memory is very short. Our memory can't even remember events of this one life. How can we remember anything of past lives? And it's good that we don't remember past lives. This life would be like hell if we remember all past lives. Therefore, it's good we are confined to a small bit of memory and we, within that, have to operate. But we don't know how long we have waited. But nobody comes to the spiritual path unless that person is a seeker of the spiritual path. Those who are happy with what's going on are not interested in the spiritual path. They let them enjoy. Let them suffer and enjoy. That's what they're here for. That's what life is all about. If somebody says, no, I'm tired of that. This is not my place. I don't feel like it. I feel it's time to go home. Inside feeling, the seeking is there. Then you are a candidate for the spiritual path. It's not something that you have to be propagating. Let's go. It's a great revolution going on. There's no revolution like this going on. It's a path meant for those who are seeking. Who've been seeking for a long time. And their time has come. And this is such a long process. How do we, what is the measure by which a perfect living master, one who has already attained all these five states of consciousness, physical, astral, causal, spiritual, total, who has seen all that, experienced all that, holds all that together, even when he's in any form. A perfect living master is not one of those who has had an experience, then he's like us. And then when he comes to us, he, he doesn't know he has to go back to see what's going on there. It's not like that. Nor can anybody else see more than one state of reality except by going to the top. When you go to the top, you find the whole realities were created as levels from there. You can hold all the five realities from there. And they're all real and all unreal at the same time. And that's only possible. So when we say perfect living master, we are not talking of enlightened people who have seen something inside. We are talking of those who have gone to the top. And while we are there, human beings amongst us, they are with us at the next level, they are with us in the top level, they are with us in the final level, and they are ourselves at the top level. They are the same self. That's the kind of person we are talking of. But in a human state, when they come to us, they are aware of all states of creation, all states of consciousness. So therefore, when they interact with us, they examine you are ready to go. And the point when which you, you, they determine you are ready is the point when they take responsibility for your journey back home. Total 100% responsibility. They initiate you. Initiation is the most significant event that can happen to anybody's life in this whole cycle of life. When they initiate, initiation is not teaching. Initiation is not teach. This is the method of, method of doing meditation. You can read in the books. They don't teach you, here are these five words, repeat. They are in the books. Anybody can tell you. They are not doing their, okay, uh, close your eyes and do this. They are not teachers. Initiation is not a method of teaching. There are thousands of teachers around the world teaching the same thing today. They are not teachers at all. When they initiate a person, they take total responsibility to take that soul, the individuated self of that person, back home and be one with themselves. They compare that there is a philosopher's stone that if you touch it, touch iron with it, it becomes gold. But they are not those kind of philosopher's stones. They have come not to improve our life. They have not come to change our life into something better. They have come to touch us and make us like themselves. That philosopher's stone touches steel, iron and makes it philosopher's stone and not gold. Their task is, take those who are ready, ready at the time. 
because we are all in a time frame here. We are living physical life in a time frame. They come and touch us through their awareness of all five stages. Through that awareness, they say, this soul is ready. It has gone through the experiences over millions of years. Today, it is ready to go back home. Okay, this soul is on my list here. Initiate. They take 20, full 100% responsibility that you go home. All the rest is to appease your mind. All the rest, do meditation, do this thing, all that, is because that's what our mind wants. Our mind wants to struggle. Our mind says you can achieve nothing without struggling. We've been brought up like that. We have allowed our mind to grow like that. That nothing can be achieved without your effort. So we put in our best effort. And they encourage us. Put in your best effort. If they know that effort is not going to give us the things, why do they make us put us through all this effort? Do more meditation. Spend to how much uh, are you doing? One hour, two hours. No, at least two and a half hours. Make it three and a half hours. Do eight hours if you want results. Why? All the time knowing that those eight hours are going to go waste. At the end, we'll see what happened. Eight hours didn't do anything. What happened? Forty years of meditation didn't do anything. Where did things go? Why are they making somebody do all this? Because unless you go through the process of putting in your best effort and failing, you don't believe that effort is not the way. The mind will not believe it. We are so trained, our mind, that only effort will achieve results that they say, okay, make an effort for us. There was a very, very devoted disciple of great master, the Van Dariyailal. He was a very big official in a nearby state from the Dera. He was a finance minister there. He was a judge there, justice. And he also held high positions. But when he retired, he came to Great Master. And he said, I want to do I serve you. And Great Master said, you are a very educated person. You can run the secretariat. You can become my secretary. You can be head of the entire organization. You have got a lot of qualifications to lead groups together. You can do all these. He says, no. If you answer my prayer, my prayer is for one kind of seva only. The great master said, what is that? He said, I want to be your doorman. The great master said, granted. And he remained his doorman all his life. And he was so happy. All the people who came to see great master passed through the doorman. And doorman heard their beautiful stories of their experiences with great master. So he was very happy. But after some years, he went to great master and said, master, I have been very happy with you. It's changed my life. But one thing I've missed out. I didn't do enough meditation. I was busy standing on the door. And your teaching says that you should do two and a half hour meditation. I missed on my meditation. Now can I have a chance to meditate and catch up with the lost time? And he said, Master, I understand. You go to a hill station, the lousy, in the hills every summer. And this summer, you're not going there. Can you give me the keys of your house? I know it has got great ambience and great spiritual vibration because you live there and people meditate there. So if you allow me to take your keys of your house and I will go and meditate continuously for two or three months, day and night, to catch up with the lost time. Great master took the keys from his pocket. He said, here are the keys. Go, enjoy yourself, meditate. So this judge took the keys, very happy, now is the chance to catch up with my meditation. Went to the hills, opened up the great master's house. As soon as he opened, the man came running. I am the plumber. You know, I've been waiting for somebody to come. All the plumbing has to be redone. So I'll work on it. He said, okay, okay, do your work. Don't disturb me too much. A few minutes later, another person comes. Every day, there was more distraction than he ever had before. After three months, he comes back. And he returned the key. says, master, I failed. I went to catch up on meditation and I couldn't meditate at all. There was so much distraction, more distraction there in your house than I had even here. Great master said, you did not fail, you passed. You passed the exam and discovered it's not your effort that gets you anything on this path. What counts? Then he said, what does, what does it count? What counts? He said, what counts is that which goes beyond the mind. All effort is based on the mind. 
Our spiritual path starts from beyond the mind. Great master said, my spiritual path starts from where the soul alone has been found and finds its totality in Satchikhand. From Parabrahm to Satchikhand is by path. The rest is all for other people to practice. They can come up there. My path starts from above the mind. And all struggle, all effort is only to appease your mind, to make your mind fail and see this is not in the hands of your mind to go beyond itself, to go beyond the mind. Is there something that goes beyond the mind? Yes. Only that can go beyond the mind which originates from beyond the mind. There are three things that originate from the beyond mind and they're still with us. One is the experience of love. Love is not created by the mind. No amount of thinking can create it. No amount can develop it. Love is innate in our souls, in that which is our true self. Intuition, a knowledge without thinking, a knowledge beyond the thoughts that the mind generates comes from beyond. Beauty and a feeling of joy and bliss comes from beyond the mind. These cannot be created by the mind and do not are not affected by the law of effort. Therefore, if these are your tools, and these are the tools that perfect living masters use, you will notice what is it that pulls us towards the perfect living master. When all is said and done, it's not what he says. It's not what he's teaching. We have heard those teachings before. We have read all these things before. Then what is it that's pulling us? What is pulling us? The innate knowledge and the unconditional love that a master is giving us. This unconditional love is a great sign of a master. Perfect living master gives us unconditional love that nobody else we have seen in this physical world can do it. Our love is conditional. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. Therefore, I love you a lot. And if the other person says, I hate you, then you hate her also. That kind of love is not love. Pure love comes where the beloved occupies your own space in the head and you don't think of the I, but think of the beloved. It's the only experience I have discovered in this world where this ego, the I-ness can be put behind on the back benches and the beloved comes in front. So where the experience of love is the real thing. What happens is that although we are having no experience through effort, we keep on building an experience through love. Sometimes it looks so irrational. It doesn't make sense that all my effort is not giving anything and yet I feel so close. What's happening? What's pulling me into it? These are operations that are taking place beyond the mind. And a perfect living master is operating with that. He may start exactly where we are, starting physical things. Don't eat this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this. All, all looks very nice. It's a good path. We like to follow it. It makes sense to us. And then it comes up to the next level. Don't think like this. Don't, don't do this. Do the repetition of word. Do this. Okay, that looks nice too. It makes sense to the mind to do it. And then when all that fails, then he says, it's only love and devotion that matters. I was surprised to get a videotape from somebody singing a song of Bullesha. Bullesha is the guy who said, it's not difficult to find God. You just put your attention from here, here you find him. He also talks of the method. And he says, there is no method to find God except through love and devotion and surrender. All the other things that we are taught are to reach that point where our love and devotion becomes perfect and none of the other things bother us. He says, the Malvi came to give me my book to read, the scripture to read. And I held the scripture in my hand and when I looked, I saw the beloved The book fell down from my hand. The Malvi said, what are you doing? You're dropping the scriptures down. He said, I have seen something that I can read no more. He describes the state of a person who is in love. The state of a person whose beloved catches him. There are such beautiful verses which I, it brought tears into my eyes. I read that. Don't, tears don't come easily into my eyes. They come only either when I hear something like that or when I go and see movies. These, these movies look more real to me than physical world somehow. So, but this was very touching. And I discovered that the real secret of the spiritual path is this, love and devotion. The other things are for the mind to reach the point where the mind does not become a distraction. 
does not become an obstacle in our way. The mind is the greatest obstacle. In fact, I would not be wrong in saying, ultimately, the mind is the only obstacle in our way to our true home. And yet, we have to appease the mind, play with it, be diplomatic with it, treat it with different kinds of games. And all these things that we do by way of meditation, by way of following diets, following this, are appeasement for the mind. They are all to satisfy the mind, to keep it at bay. So it does not obstruct us from a spiritual journey which is beyond the mind. These are such wonderful experiences that perfect living masters can give us. They don't give us, they don't say, here's the way, now you go. That would be too dark a leap to take. I am willing to take some leap, but not the whole way long. I need a guide. I need a guide outside, I need a guide inside too. If I'm getting a guide outside telling me, why can't he also guide me inside? Therefore, the area in which he wants you to take a leap of faith is very limited, very small, and can make sense even to our minds. The area in which he wants us to make a, take a leap of faith is only to reach the third eye center behind the eyes. He calls it the airport from where our flight will take off. He calls it the railroad station where the train is waiting. He is waiting with our tickets in his hand. All our journey, all our responsibility after initiation by a perfect living master is to reach that point. Yet we can take a whole lifetime in that because of distractions. And if the distractions are less, we take less time. So he gives us the methods to overcome those distractions. We follow them, not because they themselves are going to take us anywhere. If repetition of words could take anybody anywhere, the parrots would all go to Saj Khan. And if waking up at night and sitting in the morning in bed would take us out there, all the stray dogs would go to Saj Khan. These are not my words, these are Bulle Shah's words. He said, these people will take a win over you if these were the things. He said, no, forget it. It's love and devotion alone that will take you there. Once, it's an old story. I'll just uh, finish with this story and then talk to you later in the day. Bulle Shah, I love that man. He was such a simple man, very simple, but he spoke with so much sincerity. He was a disciple of a Muslim peer, a Muslim murshid who gave him instructions how to meditate. And he liked that meditation. One day there was a wedding function in Bulle Shah's house. Some relative's wedding was taking place. And Bulle Shah invited his master to come and attend the wedding. Unfortunately, the master was busy that time and he couldn't make it. So he sent one of his servants. He said, you go and represent yourself as my representative, that you are going on my behalf. So the servant went and attended the wedding. When he arrived there, Bullesha's family thought the servant has just come, master could not come. They treated him like a servant. They put him like it was old tradition, put the servant in a separate place, they sat near the door and the guests sat on the tables and guests had great time and the servant was sitting outside. So the wedding was over. And the servant goes back and the master says, how was the wedding? He said, it was pretty good. Did they treat you with honor? Not really, master, because they treated me like a servant. He said, didn't you tell them that you are representing me? He said, I did say that you sent me on his behalf, but they still treated me like a center. He said, that's not good. You were representing me there. They should have treated me like the master was there. And so the next function, the master would not attend. Bullesha realized the master got displeased with him because his family did not treat that servant well. He writes his most poignant, beautiful love letters during that period to his master. Please forgive me. Please forgive me for what happened. And I want to come back to you. No reply. Master is still displeased. So he says, I have to please my master, no matter what. So another function was taking place in master's house, in his family some wedding or something. And they had called a lot of dancing girls and some entertainers to come entertain the guests. He found an easy trick. He dressed himself up like a dancing girl, Pulesha, and went and danced with those girls. And master could see, and he called him. He said, you're not a dancing girl. 
آر یو بلے شاہ ہی سیڈ نو آئی ایم ناٹ اے بلے شاہ آئی ایم اے پلا شاہ دیٹ مینس آئی ایم دا ون میڈ اے مسٹیک آئی میڈ اے مسٹیک اینڈ ہی ہگ دم اینڈ سیڈ نو سال از فار گیون ناؤ دیٹ ون انسیڈنٹ میکس دس مین رائٹ اباؤٹ ڈانسنگ ہی سیز اف آئی اوپن مائی آئیز اینڈ سی مائی میسٹر آئی کانٹ ہیلپ بٹ ڈانس سم تھنگ فورس مین ٹو ڈانسنگ آئی پٹ آن دوز لٹل اینکلٹس bringing bells around my ankles and dance i can't help it this is uh, the kind of thing that happens to us when we are in love so examples like that exist where they find that we cannot afford to displease or displease our master because in human form he is kamas his love is so much how can we serve how can we do something for him how can we serve ourselves in our own reality which is being expressed outside in the form of a master If everything outside is an illusion, isn't the master also an illusion? How can there be difference? How can you say a master is not illusion and everything else is? A master is as much illusion as anything else. Then what's the reality? How is illusion speaking to us so well? Because the illusion is your own self. Only we don't know it. We can't see ourself inside to appear as outside. He appears outside not to draw us outside. but to push us back to inside where we find he's inside all the time he's really inside ultimately he's really us ourselves nobody else so our true master if you go by this definition is our own self in its highest form and since we can't realize our own self the master takes all these forms at different levels eventually taking us to where we realize ourselves self realization is the same for realization if you can find a true self there will be nothing else except the self and that's what we call the ultimate creator you can give any name to it so we are on a discovery of the self the self that never changes the self that never alters self that is not subject to any laws self that is immortal and the self that we are all trying to discover through different processes we call meditation love devotion all these are methods to find our self Thank you very much for very patient listening to me. I'm sharing these things which I got from my master, and I hope that they will they'll be useful to you. I'll see you again later in the afternoon and tomorrow and day after. We have three days sessions. There'll be time for questions and answers.